Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this lecture number 17 uh, in the course on the psychology of language. Now what we have been doing in the last uh, lecture is we have been looking at the cognitive processes which is involved in the reading and writing. Now I have told you previously that reading and writing is something which is not natural for human beings. The reason being that there are no uh, brain systems or there are no brain areas which are dedicated for either reading or writing. And as you can understand that both reading and writing, it has evolved uh, in the last few centuries only, it is a newer development. And uh, it only evolved when human beings settled and formed agrarian societies. So these systems, the systems of reading and writing is a newly developed system. And so what these systems actually do is they make use of those brain areas and processes which are dedicated to some other uh, uh, functions to some other cognitive processes. So uh, before uh, continuing this lecture and talking more about reading and writing and reviewing what we did in reading and writing in the last class, let us take a small journey back to the very start of this course so that we have some context on where the course is. So we started off by looking at what is uh, language for that matter and then how language is different from communication. We looked at what is the need of a language and uh, for understanding language we started looking at the very basic communication system. So the first step that we took was distinguishing between what is language and communication. Once we had established that, we looked at the most primitive form of communication which is the animal communication system. So we looked at what is animal communication system and once we had an idea of what an animal communication system is, we looked at examples of that, uh, that kind of a system. Some of these examples being the uh, waggle dance of the honey bee, being the uh, call of the weight monkeys and other basic systems of information transfer or uh, transfer of certain ideas between animals. We looked at characteristics of those kind of a language and from there we developed on uh, to understanding the human language system. We looked at how the pyramid of the human language system exists and what are the various functions of different steps in this pyramid. So what is the role of different steps? We looked at the idea of phones, we looked at how these phones combine together to form something called the morphemes which are uh, not exactly words uh, but some form of a word which has some meaning. And then we looked at how these morphemes combine together to form something called words and these word combining again using certain syntactic rules, uh, certain uh, uh, grammatical rules to form sentences. And then how the sentences then form a discourse. Now discourse is when people talk. So we looked at this kind of thing. Once we had an idea of how human language system is, some idea of the human language system, the characteristics of the human language system, we moved on to two other processes. One being looking at the evolution of the uh, the language system, the human language system and the other being uh, looking at certain evidences for it. So we started off by looking at how the human language system developed from our great, great, great grandfathers and we looked at evidences, uh, specific evidences, for example, the idea of re uh, recursion in language particularly in the English language. We looked at the idea of how a specific Fox Pro gene was, uh, was held responsible for language development. We looked at the continuity and discontinuity theories of language and further to that we also looked at evidences um, such as the use of Pidgin in the proto languages and the existence of um, the, the 
the development of the eye or um, uh, certain development of the auditory system, the vocal tract, how these uh, suggest that language developed from uh, the um, ancient humans uh, which was there and so language had some other form in ancient humans and it developed over the years. So, once we had a brief idea or a brief history of what language was all about, the other obvious reason was uh, the other obvious uh, fact was to look at how the science of language really works. And so, we dedicated ourselves into lecture 3 and 4 into understanding this science of language. We started off by looking at what is a scientific method in language studies and so uh, how experimental designs are used, what are variables and those kind of things. So, exactly how research is done in language studies. We looked at the researches in language studies from two basic parameters or two basic type or uh, two basic methodologies, one being the behavioral technique where we focus mostly into something called latency which is the reaction time and other is the accuracy. From the electrophysiological point of view or the brain system point of view, we looked at regions of the uh, uh, brain which is responsible for producing languages and those kind of equipment, those kind of methodologies that we use for measuring brain responses which are uh, responsible for producing language and so that is what we did in the second section. Now, having had an idea of what language is all about, a little bit of history of language and looking at a little bit of evidences for supporting those histories, also understanding how uh, research in language is done and what are the various uh, intricacies in uh, language studies. Now, we dwell into understanding how spoken language because uh, the, the idea of language that we are doing here is we will start with spoken language and then go to written languages. So, we uh, started looking at how spoken language is perceived and produced. So, these were uh, the, the next two sections which is uh, the section on uh, uh, lecture number uh, 5, 6 and 7, 8 if I remember it correctly. And so, in uh, especially in the lectures on language perception, we looked at how sound is perceived. Now, language basically is is composed of uh, the written words or spoken words and so, since we are looking at spoken words, we looked at how language is perceived. We are interested in looking at those factors which help in uh, the perception of language. We are specifically interested in understanding auditory perception because language mostly spoken language mostly has, follows the rules of auditory perception. So, we looked at those rules, we looked at those parameters of auditory perception. For example, what is uh, the uh, uh, what is overtone, what is general frequency, uh, what is base frequency and those kind of things. We focused on how the human ear is built up and how it picks up sound and uh, how it modulates sound or how does it deal with sound waves which enter the ear. So, we'll, we are now looking at sound perception, how do we perceive sound. We looked at the speech stream, for example, if some, something is spoken to you, what does it consist of is what we looked at. We looked at those pressures uh, of words which are which are uh, spoken to you. So, whether they are continuous and discontinuous and what kind of forms it can take and what are, uh, how is a, 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 a consonant and a vowel represented in the speech stream. So, we looked at the speech stream through a spectrometer, the various uh, and, uh, the various um, uh, basic principles of the speech stream or what is it consist of, what is the composition of a speech stream. Then we looked at the, the theory for development of speech perception, we looked at how speech perception happens in children, um, we looked at several ideas and several models in there and finally, we looked at several theories of speech perception where we focused mainly on three theories. We focused on the idea of motor theory which basically suggests that motor movements in, uh, in addition to um, uh, perception of motor movements in addition to perception of sound waves actually help us in perceive language. We looked at the general auditory framework which says that nothing like the uh, what the motor theory happens and we looked at the idea of direct realism also as a theory of uh, speech perception. Now, once we had some idea of how speech is perceived, our next interest was looking at how speech is produced because if it is produced only then it will be perceived. And so, we looked at those apparatus in the human systems which produce speech so uh, a detailed analysis of what the vocal cord is and how the production of speech happens. We then 
dedicated ourselves into understanding the speech areas in the brain, various speech areas of the brain, how they interact, particularly focusing ourselves into the, uh, the Broca and the Wernicke area. Of course, these are the same areas which are used for, for producing speech and also perception of speech. So, we uh, area by area we looked at Broadman area um, for speech production and the speech perception and so focusing on to the Broca and the uh, Wernicke area and also some areas on the on the temporal cortex and the uh, the frontal prefrontal cortex which are in uh, example the insula which is used for producing speech. We looked at several models of speech production for example, we looked at the feed forward feedback model, we looked at the DIVA model which is a computational model of speech production and several other models uh, which uh, tell us how speech is produced and lastly we looked at development of speech production. So, how does speech production actually develop? We looked at those principles, we looked at those variables, we looked at the nature of speech production in children. So, once we had an idea of how speech is produced and how speech is perceived, the next step was obviously focusing on um, the idea of how this speech, what does this speech compose of first of all, uh, what is the basic unit of speech and how does this speech uh, uh, relate to some idea and for that we needed to study a concept, an abstract concept of what is called a word. Now, word is basically a combination of two or three things. It has a pronunciation which is basically the, the speech part of it and it also has a meaning which is the symbol that it represents. So, we started looking at what is word and how does word represent an idea in terms of symbolism and, uh, and, and uh, 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 a speech sound in terms of perception. So, we started looking at what is word and we look started looking at what is the anatomy of a word. So, how many different kind of words can exist? We looked at uh, basically enlightened two different kinds of words, the functional word and the uh, content word. So, we looked uh, dedicated ourselves to that and we also looked at how words uh, uh, establish itself as concepts or uh, they are labeled as concepts and uh, again focused on the phonology of the word and the semantic meaning of a word. Once we had done that, we started looking at how words are learned. So, how do children learn words? So, we looked at the, sh uh, the various curves which exist, the S curve or uh, the idea of how neighborhood density or different words help children learn words. So, that is what we were interested in, we are looking at how people develop uh, this word lexicon uh, in or the idea of uh, how words are processed and saved in uh, processed by humans. So, how do humans learn words or children learn word for that matter if not adults because the adults have already learned a number of words. So, what are the uh, various uh, factors and variables and, and uh, methodologies through which children learn word. The next thing that we were interested in once a word is le learned where it is saved. So, we are looking at the mental, the idea of the mental lexicon and the cortical lex lexicon which basically suggests that words are stored as something called networks and these are, these has certain uh, same properties the semantic memory. So, here what I will do is I will refer you back to the my lecture on cognitive psychology where we discussed what is semantic memory. And so, uh, start looking at that and have an idea of how words are stored into the mental lexicon in terms of semantic information. And lastly, the last idea that we did was we looked at how these words are retrieved. So, what is the process of retrieval of this word uh, from the mental lexicon and there we were interested in looking at uh, uh, recognition of words and several other models which explain word recognition uh, and word retrieval, uh, the one being the leaflet model and the other being the Dell interactive model which explains how words are retrieved from the memory. Now, once we had an idea of what a word is, the next obvious thing was words combining into sen sentences. Why? single words have no meaning and so the other idea was to understand what is sentences and so we looked at what sentences are, how words uh, group together to form sentences. So, what is the structure of a sentence and uh, what is the syntactic, how does uh, the children learn uh, to comprehend sentences. Now, since sentences have a number of words and the same word may function as uh, a content word or a function word, so how do children understand comprehension of a sentence was the next thing that we focused on. We looked at how children produce sentences or people produce sentences, what are the factors responsible for it and how sentence production, uh, what are the factors which actually help in production of a sentence. And the last thing is that we were concerned is how syntactic structures or syntactic rules for producing of sentences are learned. That is what we were focusing on 
uh, the, the idea of what a uh, sentence is or how sentences uh, structuring is. Now, once we have sentences, we need to converse and there is the idea of discourse we jumped in. So, we looked at what is discourse, how does discourse really work in. So, discourse is people talking and so there are two forms of discourse, we have the conversation and we have the narratives. In conversation, many people speak and so uh, they take their turns in speaking and in terms of uh, narrative, one person speaks and the other listens. So, we started off by first understanding what is a conversation, what is turn taking, how do people understand their turn in conversations and how they, they talk and find uh, and, and how ex exchange of ideas is happening in conversation and other basic uh, factors influencing conversation. The next thing that we are interested in is understanding what a narrative is and uh, how does this narrative and uh, lead to references. We looked at what are story grammars, so basically it is a form of narrative and so most stories actually use uh, uh, something called story grammars. We looked at the idea of referencing in narratives and how this referencing actually helps us in forming a good narrative or uh, forming a better narrative. The next thing that we were interested in is, is understanding the idea of anaphora which is a replacement word for most content words and so anaphora uh, you can think of anaphora as uh, uh, as, as as a pronoun or um, in some other uh, times it is used as a replacement word and so what anaphora does is it, it actually helps us in comprehending a sentence. So, we looked at the, uh, the principles of using anaphora and how this anaphora is used in sentences and how it helps us in inferring meaning from sentences in discourse. The last thing that we uh, learn is the, uh, how uh, the abilities for learning discourse is developed in both adults and children and how uh, some kind of uh, uh, problems in uh, looking at specific problems in discourse learning, they point out the various factors of discourse learning. The next thing that we were uh, doing in the last class was looking at reading and writing. Now, as I said reading and writing is something that is uh, that is not natural, it is something that we um, develop over a period of time and so the first thing that we looked at is what are the different forms of writing systems in the world. So, we looked at three different writing systems, one is the logographic form, the other is the syllabary form and the th third one was the alphabet form. We also looked at how these, what these writing systems are all about and then we looked at something called orthography which is the set of writing the words of a language. So, we are focusing on uh, this kind of uh, orthographic changes or this kind of rules that are used and what we understood from there is there are two types of orthogra uh, orthographies. Uh, one is the shallow orthography in which the pronunciation and the word that uh, that is uh, uh, meant that is spelled it means the same and the other one the pronunciation and the spelling are different. So, some words uh, some languages have deeper orthography for example, English has deeper orthography uh, and on the other hand German and uh, uh, Korean have shallow orthography. So, we looked at how these orthographies really work. We also looked at distinguishing between shallow and uh, uh, deep orthography in terms of using the homophone and the homographs. We looked at how the brain uh, processes and brain systems are uh, piggybacked on to, uh, to help us reading and writing. So, we looked at how the visual form area uh, the, they perceive the symbols that we write uh, to form words and from there how does it extract meaning and, and the idea of neuronal uh, recycling hypothesis. We looked at cognitive processes in reading uh, which is how uh, the missing letter effect and the idea of eye movements uh, actually uh, idea of eye movement and perceptual span actually helps us in uh, reading. We also looked at the idea of fixation duration as a um, uh, as a predictor of the reading ability and the dual root model of course, which explains us how does reading happens. Lastly, the last thing that we were doing was we were looking at text comprehension. So, how does text comprehension happen and uh, how does implicit personality hypothesis or inner wise, uh, inner wise system explains us how do we comprehend text. Today's class is we will we'll focus on to the development of reading skills uh, and uh, how do people, uh, children and adults learn to read. Now, development of reading is something which is very difficult because most people do not ever read anything and so uh, learning to read is, is in itself uh, uh, a difficult 
uh, job. Now, one of the things that make reading uh, difficult is the fact that learning to read makes difficult is complicated by a variety of font styles and uh, and, and uh, sizes and so on and so forth. So, when we read it could be hand, handwritten text, it could be a uh, text which is written on uh, some form of a pamphlet, on a paper, on, on some other formats. And so, reading gets difficult by the type of fonts that we use, by the type of sizes of uh, the letters that we are using, the words that we are using, the styles that we are using and so on and so forth. Just look at this A, A and G, G and that will give you an idea of how reading can be difficult. So, the first obvious step in any reading is uh, uh, reading scale is learning the letters of uh, writing the particular system. Now, it is complicated by these facts and so novice readers they need to develop abstract representation of the letters. So, the first step that any novice reader has to do in terms of reading is to develop these uh, abstract representation of letters. So, how do you do that? It happens there is a certain region of the brain which helps the uh, readers to make abstract configurations or to make abstract um, uh, concepts of what a letter would actually mean or what a symbol would actually mean. And and that actually helps us in um, uh, in uh, in uh, in reading uh, and, and uh, understanding symbols and reading. Now, this process of abstracting that this uh, that this particular brain area does, or the visual occip the occipital area of the brain does, is called prototyping. So, what the brain does is it starts understanding handwriting. Now, novice readers mainly use. Uh, most device readers they uh, develop a set, of, a set of abstract representations for each letter for visual word form and more generally. Uh, so, they learn to recognize word regardless of the font, case or style. And so, how does it happen? What happens is since they look at a number of presentations of these letters, they quickly develop a prototype out of it and prototype is the best example uh, or uh, the minimalistic example of any, uh, uh, any number of um, uh, uh, object variations uh, that can exist. And so, they develop this prototype. For example, the prototype of a car is uh, having an engine and four doors uh, and, and a, a cover on, onto it. This is the basic prototype. And in that, if you keep on adding things, you can get a sports car, you can get a sedan or whatever and what not. Similarly, the way H can be written in different styles, the basic idea of writing an H is having these two things. And so, developing a prototype requires us to have these two things and so, uh, a letter like this and a letter like this. So, I can write an H like this, I can very well write an H like this and so, this is how abstract uh, the development of prototype is and so, this helps uh, uh, the readers, the novice readers to understand uh, the various styles and, and or less complicate uh, the idea of reading. Now, another thing that helps uh, readers in understanding uh, or uh, in learning to read is reading aloud. Now, novice readers they have they read with flat intonation pauses at appropriate places and locations and this helps them in actually reading. Now, novice readers mainly use the indirect route accessing pronunciations before meaning, but they gradually shift to greater reliance on a direct route. So, initially what novice readers actually do is they pronounce the word and from there they start to extract meaning of the word. But if and and is as they keep on doing that, as they become skilled readers, they use a more direct method of reading or, or, uh, or learning to read and what they then do is they access meaning before pronunciation as the reading skill. Now, this shift can be observed in a neuroimaging studies which show that more activity in the dorsal stream of early readers and but more activity in the ventral stream of the skilled readers. And so, if, if you can see if, if the neuroimaging studies produce uh, what they, they say is that ventral stream is about meaning and dorsal stream is about uh, pronunciation. We have done this or uh, we have made this clear right from the, the section on words. So, what happens is novel readers uh, they read aloud and this read aloud help them in making understanding the pronunciation of the words and this pronunciation of the words actually help them in understanding the meaning. But as they develop over a period of time, the start accessing the meaning and from there they go back to the pronunciation. So, skill readers they are natural intonations, pauses and persodic phase boundaries. Now, silent reading skills depend on difficulty of text and uh, skill of the readers. Now, it is not that skill readers do not actually read uh, with an inner voice in, in as we explained in text comprehension. What happens is for easy text they do not do this inner reading or the, with the inner voice, but as the text gives, gets difficult, no, uh, the skill readers also start doing something called silent reading. 
So, how the, re, uh, the, the reading is developed, the skill of reading is developed. Uh, now, uh, the thing is that there is a wide range of outcomes which can be expected and reading disability they depend on the arbitrary cutoff point of the normal distribution. What really happens is that uh, unlike skilled uh, un, un, unskilled readers, they often read aloud with flat intonation and pauses in appropriate locations, uh, while skilled readers learn to read with natural intonations and pausing for a prosodic phase boundaries. Now, what happens out of this is that this is in line with the, uh, this happens why because this particular fact that uh, the natural readers use something called naturalistic uh, way of reading and the unskilled readers follow flat intonation. This is in line with something called the implicit prosodic hypothesis if you remember from the last lecture which proposes that prosody guides the comprehension even in uh, silent reading by breaking the text into short meaningful phrases which fits into the limits of the short term memory. And so by doing that by using this prosodic boundaries they are able to understand chunks of text which helps them in understanding meaning. Now experienced readers they tend to read faster suggesting that reading has become an automatic process for them. Measurable differences in reading speed and uh, reading comprehension uh, can already be detected in the first grade elementary school while reading is first taught. Now, uh, reading is actually a learned skill. It is only reasonable to expect a wide range of outcomes from this kind of a list. So, so, since reading is something which we learn, which is learned over a period of time and so a wide range of outcomes would happen. Some would read fast, some would read slow, some would read with a certain ability. So, there is a wide range of uh, 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 outcomes which can come out of it and so reading disability, uh, they depends on the arbitrary cutoff point on normal distribution. So, generally there is a normal distribution which has been proposed for this reading ability and as you can see this normal distribution says that mostly, so this is a bell curve and so 68 percent population should fall in this. Most people have this kind of reading ability. And as you go farther and farther away from 1 sigma to 2 sigma to 3 sigma and 4 sigma, you find the disabilities happening. And so, most people have this kind of a skill of the, uh, this reading skill development and as you move away from it, you have reading disabilities. Now, these reading disabilities give us a good idea of what can go wrong in, uh, in, in reading or in understanding the development of reading in normal populations. Now, one probable uh, cause of a reading deficiency is called dyslexia. Now, what is dyslexia? And in dyslexia, people are not able to read. So, uh, people are not able to read properly and that is a, a form of disorder in which reading ability is hurt. And one form of dyslexia is called the letter position dyslexia. Now, what is this letter position dyslexia? In letter position dyslexia, it is a kind of a rare form of reading disorder in which the order of letters are actually mixed up. And this is uh, and uh, in most cases people with dyslexia experiences problem with reading accuracy and fluency. So, what happens is the order of the letters get mixed up and this is one form of dyslexia. Generally dyslexia is a form of uh, 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 reading disability. Now, reading top as pot or spelling it as uh, it t it should be t here it as t is actually a uh, form of letter position dyslexia, not typical case of dyslexia. So, this is not a typical kind of dyslexia. The commonest form of dyslexia is called the developmental dyslexia. Now, dyslexia is a learning disorder as I have explained to you. So, this is a reading disability generally formed in children. It is a reading ability in children that cannot be attributed to lack of intelligence. So, this kind of reading ability dyslexia cannot be attributed to something called intelligence failures, to motivational failures that uh, it is it, not that dyslexia happens because of lack of motivation or educational opportunity. It is that sometimes children get educational opportunities still they have dyslexia, this reading disorders. And so, this form of uh, disorder in which the dyslexia cannot be attributed to intelligence, motivation or the chances of education is called the developmental dyslexia. Now, about 5 to 70 percent of school age populations is considered to suffer from a specific uh, reading disorder. Uh, and this disorder is the dyslexia. Now, as I said, this cannot be attributed to lack of intelligence, motivation or educational opportunity and 5 to 17 percent school age population depending on the cutoff have some kind of 
dyslexia. Now, prevalence of dyslexia similar to uh, worldwide regardless of the language or writing system. And so, this dyslexia is actually prevalent all around the world. It is not that a specific form of language or a, a specific region of the world has this, uh, this preference of a dyslexia. So, a genetic component to dyslexia or is, is been found out and it is also found that certain environmental factors such as lack of reading material at home put children at a higher risk of dyslexia. So, dyslexia cannot be attributed to certain languages, certain regions. Uh, sometimes dyslexia is related to a certain gene has been proved that certain gene is responsible for dyslexia and other times it is the environmental factors which has been uh, responsible for uh, dyslexia. Now, development dyslexia first becomes apparent when the child starts reading uh, learning to read uh, the roots of the disorder can be found in spoken language deficit. So, dyslexia actually happens starts when um, uh, the spoken language uh, uh, is, is, um, is hindered in uh, uh, children and so that is the first step that you find in any dyslexia. Uh, now, through experience with nursery rhymes and language games, preschoolers they actually begin to acquire an understanding of the word how the words can be broken down into similar sound structures and the insight from a natural language is known as phonological awareness. Now, children at the time when they are in their nurseries, they have, they develop something called phonological awareness. And so, what is phonological awareness? This awareness that bigger words can be broken down into smaller words through pronunciations and it then it can be spelled and meaning can be extracted out of it is called phonological awareness. And so, this this happens late in children with dyslexia. Now, the, what is phonological awareness? It is the understanding that words can be broken down into smaller sound structures. Recognizing the onset of tic-tac-toe and rhymes cat, sat and mat can a uh, clap to rhythm of a syllables. Uh, so, this this kind of thing happens in smaller children. They uh, they understand the onset of tic tac toe has uh, the same T word and uh, or, or it rhymes similarly. For example, cat, sat and mat in this the first letter is uh, rhyming in this, the last letter is rhyming. So, understanding this thing or the clapping to rhythm of syllables is something that that, that is called phonological awareness that is present in smaller children. And what does phonological awareness actually do? They help them, phonological help them, uh, awareness help them in understanding learning. Now, people with dyslexia or children with dyslexia do not develop this kind of phonological awareness. So, individual differences in preschooler predicts reading outcome for early school years. Now, Phonological awareness is a necessary precursor to something called reading. For any reading to happen, the phonological awareness is the first precursor or the first point which is there. Now, without sensitivity to sound structures of the word, no wise readers cannot make sense of the alphabet principle. Uh, so, without understanding the word, without understanding how something is spelt or how something is uh, pronounced uh, readers, initial readers or small school children will have no idea what the word, uh, what sense to make out of the word and uh, they are they will not be able to uh, follow something called the alphabet principle. And so, what is the alphabet principle? It is the process by which readers associate written symbols with speech sounds. So, how H is related to the sound of H? This is called the alphabet principle. Now, in alphabet principle processes of associating written symbols with speech sounds, here what happens is this is the step it happens in preschool where children learn that what a symbol actually how it is pronounced and what does it relate to. So, if I say H how does it relate to or what letter does it relate to. Now, uh, it is this insight that enables the young readers to learn the orthographic rules of their language uh, and here the children are uh, only successful to learning how to read if they can see the consistent ways of written words mapped to spoken words and this actually helps them in understanding uh, the language that they are going to learn, their mother language or whatever language that they are going to learn because this will tell you how deep the, the orthography or the written uh, the rules for writing languages are uh, developed and so they will learn how pronunciation is actually mapped onto the spelling of the word. So, must have phonological awareness first, uh, if you do not have phonological awareness you cannot learn the alphabet principles and even in Chinese since most characters are both semantic and phonetic components, we have to follow this kind of the alphabet principles. Now, although Chinese has, is a symbolic is a logographic language and so they do not have these symbols and alphabet uh, al alphabetic system, but still even there we have to have this phonological awareness and as, as explained before even in the in the logographic mostly the symbols are used for their phonological value. Now, 
uh, when the orthography is shallow as in the case of German and Spanish, the reading accuracy is less of a problem than the reading speed. Now, since there is a consistent relationship between sounds and letters in these languages, the dyslexics children learn how to sound out, sound out written words, but they still struggle with connecting to those words and their meaning in an efficient fluent way. So, dyslexics they may learn the form of a letter and they may learn the pronunciation, but they, they uh, do not have this idea or they uh, do not develop this idea of integrating the, for the, the pronunciation with the symbol of the letter. And so, that is one problem which can happen. Now, this is especially true when reading instructions includes a phone, phonic based uh, approach. So, when reading instructions, when the reading requires you to use a, phon a pronunciation based approach into learning, into uh, learning the reading or into uh, reading, there the dyslexic has most kind of a problem. And so, what does phonic break approach mainly mean? It is a method of teaching reading explicitly trains children to recognize consistent relationship between letters and sound. And so, phonic based approach is a method of teaching uh, uh, reading that explicitly trains children to recognize consistent relationship between letters and sound. And so, through this approach what we do is we make children learn that how certain sounds are produced and how these sounds are related to certain letters or certain symbols and how these certain symbols what do they mean in, in, in itself. And so, that that is called the phonic based approach of learning. No, in audio in in addition to uh, assessing phonological awareness, researchers and educators can, so how do we uh, screen for dyslexia? The susceptibility of dyslexia can be assessed in the preschool itself. So, uh, one, one thing that we can do is how do we know the children have dyslexia? We can start with a preschool uh, screening or screening at the level of the preschool itself. Various methods are available for doing this kind of a uh, preschool screening. Uh, one method is called uh, the rapid optimization na naming method here that is a diagnostic for dyslexia. Here name written, uh, name written letters, numbers and other familiar symbols as quickly as possible the children have to uh, produce that or to read that also taps into the connection between visual and phonological area of the brain. So, whether the, the rapid optimization uh, task is the names are written. Uh, the uh, names of written letters are there, of numbers are there and other famous symbols are there. Children have to quickly read it and then connect it to the meaning of it or to the symbol of it. And so, what, what it happens is dyslexic uh, children are not able to do that fast enough and why this is important is because it connects to the visual and phonological area. So, it shows that there is a connection between the symbol which is the edge that I have been talking about and the, uh, and the phonological output or the phone or the word that is coming out of it. So, the relationship between that and so one way of uh, screening children for dyslexia is using the rapid automation type. And so, what we can do? We can do an early intervention if children, if we know the children have dyslexia. One thing is explicit training in phonological awareness alphabet principle can help with early reading skills. So, we can provide them this for with phonological awareness and alphabetic principle and that can help children in developing lesser and lesser ex, uh, uh, dyslexic, becoming lesser and lesser dyslexic or uh, making uh, dyslexia, uh, uh, making more dyslexics or uh, coming up uh, uh, tra with training programs for uh, lowering the dyslexic ability in children with dyslexia. Uh, we still do not have a good technique for developing fluent reading skills. Now, since we do not have a very good technique for developing this fluent reading skills, uh, it is very difficult to train dyslexic children on it and to improve their uh, dyslexic ability or the reading ability. Now, how does the developmental dyslexia relate to the brain? First of all, developmental dyslexia, uh, it is a disorder of the brain and it leads to variety of problems not obviously related to reading. So, de uh, the development is dyslexia is a disorder of the brain, that is the first thing. And the second thing to be noted is that it leads to variety of problems which are not obviously related to reading itself. There can be several other problems which are related to it. Why does it happen? It happens because reading processes hitch a ride on the brain system which are originally designed to do other tasks and variations in other of the systems can lead to reading disorders. Uh, brain imaging studies have shown that dyslexic readers use different brain areas while uh, reading compared to normal readers. And so, this is one uh, finding which is coming from brain studies that dyslexic 
people or dyslexic children use another kind of brain area or different brain area altogether. Now, the standard reading area of the brain is the left temporal parietal region. The left temporal parietal region is a standard area for reading in, in normals, uh, in normal humans which is the dorsal stream, but the left occipital temporal region, the ventral stream are less active during uh, re uh, reading task in dyslexic individuals compared to skilled individuals and that produces uh, the uh, dyslexic in uh, uh, effect in children with dyslexia. Now, structural ability, uh, abnormalities in the reading areas can also be found in the preliterate children with the family history of reading impairment. So, structural abilities is another reason why dyslexia can happen. So, dyslexia readers uses different brain areas while reading compared with normal readers. Also, reading become automatic for most readers remain effortful for those with dyslexia. Now, as you can see with normal readers reading becomes an automatic process and so, uh, ch uh, people uh, normal children are able to do it in an automatic fashion. It is something that uh, the symbols are coded by the occipital region and then the and meaning is interpreted out of it. It's it is an automatic process, but with dyslexics, this become an effortful uh, uh, thing and so they suffer from it. And there is something called the auditory uh, processing deficit hypothesis. Now, children cannot learn to read until they have developed the phonological awareness is that we have established, but this may depend even more on some basic processes. For example, the auditory processing deficit hypothesis is a proposal that dyslexia stems from an uh, underlying difficulty in accurately detecting and remembering rapid sound changes. And so, the auditory processing hypothesis says that uh, it is basically centers on something called phonological awareness and what it says is dyslexia is coming from underlying difficulty detecting and remembering rapid sound changes. So, as the sound changes, as the pattern of sound changes, dyslexic children are not able to pick up these rapid changes in sound in sound and because of that the dyslexia happens in them or, or there is something called auditory processing deficit and so what is the auditory processing deficit actually say it is a precursor for both specific language imper impairment and developmental dyslexia now we can do uh, uh, there are also some, some other uh, the facts about the brain and dyslexia. For example, the gray matter brain tissue which is mainly composed of neuronal bodies and function is to process information. Similarly, we have white matter which is a tract uh, bundle of fibers connecting the various regions of the brain and function is to transmit information. Now, if we use something called DTI. Uh, which is a, a type of MRI that we do diffusion tensor imaging and there we it is an fMRI and MRI technique which traces pathways to white matter in, uh, in tracks and what do they say? The size and distribution of accurate fin, uh, uh, fascicles and other white mat matter tracks that is responsible. So, correlated with the reading ability in adults phonological awareness in preliterate children and so these regions uh, the regions of the white matter and gray matter in brain they are directly the size and uh, the the uh, uh, distribution of white and uh, gray matter in the brain they have a direct relation or uh, they have a, a direct correlation with the phonological awareness and uh, the reading ability in children so that's another proof which we have or evidence which we have uh, of how brain uh, is related to dyslexia or the reading ability now, we can actually do certain early interventions. For example, instead of taking a wait and see approach to slow readers, early intervention is essentially uh, the, is useful in dyslexic children. There are simple diagnostic tests such as the phonological awareness and rot, uh, rapid automation test uh, that can be used to screen preschoolers for dyslexia. So, and these kind of pre-interventions will actually help the dyslexics and so that has uh, that that uh, uh, will uh, that explain that part explain what is dyslexic and so dyslexics actually also uh, study of dyslexics also gave us some insight onto how reading is developed and what is phonological awareness and how this uh, 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 alphabet um, uh, training the, all these helps us in reading. Now, the last section that we have in, in this particular lecture is to look at all those cognitive processes which are uh, there in writing um, that is learning the ABCs of writing. Now, there are three stages of learning to write any written text reading and writing uh, are solitary task. Now, reading takes years and efforts to, re, uh, to learn and not of all, uh, all actually succeed in this task. Learning to write 
is even more challenging task, perhaps one of the most cognitively demanding task in uh, 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 that, that, that cognitive task that can exist in this world. And so, any learning uh, goes through three stages. Uh, any writing goes through three stages of learning. Learning to uh, le the symbols of a writing system, the first step in any writing when we write is to learn the symbols. Okay, English we have to remember what these symbols actually mean. So, the first step of any writing is to learn the symbols which represent certain concepts, certain words, certain meaning or for that matter anything. The second step in any writing is to learn how to combine letters to form words. So, we have we know the alphabets now, the next step is how do we combine them to form words. For example, D O G, now this is a word that, that I am writing and so you have to understand that there are three symbols that I am combining together and they combine together to form the word. So, we have to understand the rules of combining them together and also uh, once we have this, what is the meaning of this word? And the third step in any writing is learning to compose text. Once we have dog, that is not enough. We should be able to use this dog in from some kind of a text in some kind of a meaningful text. For example, the dog barks. And so, writing requires us not to only to learn this writing system, but also uh, learn the combination of letters, how to combine letters. So, basically learning the syntactic rules and composing text which is understanding how sentences comprehension or synt syntactic rules of sentences are there and how meaning is extracted out of it. Now, generally in the brain we have something called the exnas area which is responsible for exactly the same thing. Now, this is a brain region in, in the left prefrontal motor cortex just above the broker area and what is the inf what is the need of this area, what is the requirement of this area? It stores motor programs for handwriting gestures, exnas area is responsible for understanding handwriting gestures. So, no matter how you write by just looking at the handwriting, by looking at the slants of handwriting, by looking at the gestures that you are uh, making when writing something, this area is able to extract what symbol is being transferred, what symbol is being conveyed and how this symbol, what is the meaning of this symbol and how it, uh, what are the syntactic rules related to the symbol and so on and so forth. So, learning to write letters import is a um, important part of learning to read them. If we are not able to write, we will not be able to read. So, learning to write a letter, learning to write the symbol of a letter and, and uh, is, is the most important part in reading a letter. If you do not know how to write a letter, how does a letter represent, what does a letter represent, we will not be able to read them. Generally then external area is a brain region which is located to the left uh, premotor cortex just above the broker area that stores the motor program for handwriting gestures. Now, external area is activated when reading handwritten text uh, suggesting a process similar to motor perception in speech processes and play, uh, uh, places when reading handwritings. Written letters may be essential for uh, learning how to read them. But at least in the case of alpha, uh, the alphabetic system, letter, uh, letter perception and pronunciation soon become automated. As we so said that as we progress in learning, the perception of letters and pronunciation of letters both become uh, uh, automatic with passage of time. As you can see, this is my premotor cortex area, this is my exnas area which does this coding of motor movements uh, or handwriting gestures and this is my Broca area. Learning to spell. Now, an important part of uh, writing is learning to spell. If you are not able to spell, we will not be able to write. So, you should know the exact combination of how a word is pronounced and based on the pronunciation, we are able to spell a word. So, learning to how to spell a word is more challenging task uh, than learning how to read them because it requires coordination information about word forms at three different levels. Now, why it is difficult why, uh, to learning to spell because information at three different levels are required. First, at the phonological level, the young writer has to be able to analyze the spoken word into uh, smaller units such as syllables and phonemes. So, learning to spell has three levels, integration from three levels. At the phonological level, the writer of a word should be able to analyze spoken words into smaller units. So, that is the first thing that he has to be uh, he has to be doing, take the word and break it up into its uh, core word, dilemma word, the extension of it and so on and so forth and it requires the phonological awareness. Only if we have the phonological awareness, we will be able to break the word into its sub 
sub processes sub words and then the achieve what we want to achieve. At the orthographic level what happens is the novice writer has to understand the rules of interpreting or and representing spoken words into written format. So, how do we uh, write what we are speaking, how do we write it into uh, the actual format into the written format is the second thing. So, orthographic level at the orthographic level that happens translate phonemes or other phonological units into letters or letter combinations. For example, if I say cat, cat, cat or heed, how do we write it that is the basic thing. So, how am I pronouncing it town or play, how am I writing it and how am I speaking it that is the orthographic level and it requires the alphabetic principle. If you know only the al alphabetic principle only then you will be able to write the word that you are pronouncing into the actual symbolic form. And the third thing is at the morphological level here what happens it uh, the developing writer needs to understand how the structure of the word including suffixes and prefixes interact with spelling patterns. Uh, now, the young, uh, young writer can simply track the ing suffix uh, onto the root word right since the letter e is uh, silent and it is to be dropped. For example, look at this at the morphological level he has to understand how prefixes and suffixes interact with spelling patterns. Now, what happens is this prefixes and suffixes they change the spelling of a word. For example, look at the word that I have here writing. Now, if a, the rule says that if you add ing into the lemma word it becomes uh, the, uh, uh, the, le uh, the lexical word that you are interested in or the, the, the content word that you are interested in. Now, write n in, in into it. So, writing plus plan plus e is plan. So, uh, sorry the writing. Now, you have to understand the young uh, writer or whoever is a novice writer he has to understand that when writing the e is dropped here the ing there is no more e here and the e is dropped and this is called the morphological level where he understands that you have to drop the e from the lemma level of the word and then include the ing. Similarly, for planned we have to drop the uh, you have to add another n into it only then we can have plan and plan which is the future tense of plan and this is the uh, uh, lemma level of any word. Now, some people exhibit an isolated spelling disorder which is the specific and significant impairment in spelling skills even though reading ability is at a normal rate. And so, some people have something called this isolated spelling disorder and what is this isolated spelling disorder? It is a some uh, significant impairment in uh, spelling skills through a reading ability in the normal range. So, how is the developmental uh, how do we uh, try to compose text? Developmental trajectory in uh, writing the three uh, forms are there in how writing the, uh, through the development phases the children learn writing. The first is the flexible focus text no global topic sentence change together as a loose uh, sentence. Now, in this kind of flexible uh, focus text writing children are uh, they have no global to topic in hand the sentences are chained together and they form loose association for example, I, uh, I like coloring cats. I like coloring cats. Now, if you look into this, this is just a sentence, it is uh, words put together, it has no uh, sen uh, the global topic of discussion and so on and so forth. As children progress, they use something called fixed focus text. In this, each statement relates to a core topic, but little elaboration of these statements are made. For example, I like uh, Bobby. He eats chocolate, he drinks water. So, as, as I go on and on I am talking about Bobby and the specific aspects of Bobby. So, it is related to a fixed focus, but they are not related together. And the third one, third form of uh, development of trajectory of writing is a top, uh, topic elaboration text in which the set of subtopics are arranged according to common theme. For example, I like dogs. because they are cute, because they are men's best friend and so on and so forth. Here there is a similar topic and an elaboration of the topic is done. Here 
it is all about Bobby, but they are not connected in each other and here there are no connection at all and so this is how the development trajectory of writing actually happens. So, flexible focus text 1, 2, 3, 4, I do not have more of it, but uh, that is how the development of text organization in elementary school actually happens. Now, how do I compose text? Now, texts are composed in terms of something called uh, burst. Now, periods of active text composition bonded by pauses at the both end. When I am writing something, when I am composing a text, I, I uh, happen to have something called burst. Now, what is a burst? It is a period of text active composition bonded by pauses at both end. So, when, when I am writing something, the when I am writing something in a flow, this is called a burst and then I wait for it. Now, this waiting period is called a pause and this pause. So, when I am writing something fluently, this is called a burst. When I wait after writing something fluently is called a pause and what is pause? Pause is believed to reflect cognitive efforts. What am I doing in a pause? Increases the length of size of the linguistic unit of the border. It was uh, it is for 2 seconds or more and make up half the time spent in composing text. Generally in pause either I am reading what I have written before or the next thing that I can be doing in a pause is I am thinking about what has to be written after it and this is what it is. So, it is a cognitive effort which is there increases in length with the size of the linguistic unit they border. So, if they are bordering a sentence it is shorter, if they are bordering a paragraph the pauses are greater and pauses lasting 2 seconds or more make up more than half of the time spent in composing the text. Now, uh, this text uh, writing is been proposed by a model of Hayes has been proposed for writing text. Now, this is an influential theory of writing processes. It has four core writing processes, three levels of interacting cognitive processes into it. What is the Hayes model? So, earlier the Hayes model was a very simple model and now there is a more generic and more evolved Hayes model. It has basically four core processes as, as I explained uh, and three levels of interacting cognitive processes. The four core processes are the processor which generates the idea, the translator which converts the proposed idea into written spoken language strings, the transcriber which converts spoken language strings into motor plans for typing and writing and the evaluator which scans for errors. So, proposer will generate an idea the translator will convert this idea into uh, spoken language and written language and then transcriber will uh, take the spoken language strings and motor plan for typing. So, it will convert. So, this is reading, this is pronunciation and this is writing and from that the evaluator will look at what errors are there. There are three levels of uh, interacting cognitive processes which are working. So, I, I let us think of it in this way, I, I, I try to write an essay on something, the proposer will generate the idea on what, uh, so I will for the proposer what I will do is I will look at uh, several texts uh, which are available uh, to me and generate idea from that and from that the uh, once I have this idea, the proposer will put this idea in the translator who will, uh, translator will put a pronunciation or put a into spoken languages of all the ideas that I have, uh, that I have and these spoken li language uh, ideas will then be converted into written ideas through the transcriber and once the written ideas have been put into the errors that I am doing in writing is been uh, uh, taken care of by the evaluator. There are three levels of interacting the cognitive processes, we have the cognitive control which is motivation, goal, planning, writing scheme, exert top down control over the writing processes. So, there uh, the motivation, the goal that you have, the plans, the writing schemes, uh, they exert a top ground control process of what you are writing and how you are writing. The second thing is the processing level, writing processes and, and task environment. So, what kind of writing you are doing, what kind of pattern, whether you are writing on a, on a, a paper, on a blackboard, that, that is task environment and the task environment is what kind of information that you have, where the information is coming from, all those will also de determine how the writing will progress and the resources level for example, supporting writing process include short and long term memory attention, reading and so on and so forth. So, other cognitive processes for example, memory attention, reading span um, and other short term and long term memory will also decide what you write and how you write. And so, all these psychological cognitive processes and all the, these four processes, they interact uh, together to form the Hayes model. As you can see, this is my proposer, this is my evaluator, this is my transcriber and this is my translator. So, proposer leads to trans, uh, translator, translator leads to transcriber and transcriber leads to evaluator. Now, the proposer gets information from collaborative critics and, uh, and all these uh, task, task environment variables. And then there is a top down process which tells you whether the writing will progress or not in terms of motivation, goal setting, current plans and so on and so forth. And this is dependent on the resource level, the cognitive resources that you have, retention, working memory, long term memory, reading. So, all combined together will tell how a successful writing will actually develop.
you know, modeling development of writing uh, skills, uh, transcription largely automated task for adults. Uh, basically, the original Hayes model was a simpler and a more uh, uh, described model. So, uh, largely automated task for adults, but young children struggle with the task of putting letters on paper, uh, papers and typing. Now, for younger adults it is easy because uh, writing is an automated process, but younger children they struggle with the task because it is very difficult to uh, write text on paper. Now, his model views transcriptions uh, as a bottleneck for dyslexic and language impairment students. So, they say that the bottleneck is uh, the transcript, the transcription which is transcribing what the, the proposer has into, uh, into written formats is the bottleneck which leads to dyslexia in children. Now, motivation is another factor which, which helps in modeling, uh, in modeling the development of written text. Most educated adults are motivated to read write, but few are motivated to actually write. So, people would love to read, but they do not read, uh, love to, they are not so fascinated with writing and that is one of the reasons why you cannot have a right, the develop, less uh, development of writing skill. Also, lack of motivation negatively impacts the writing process. Now, writing scheme, skilled writers have something called solid intuitions about required structure, revision process and so on and so forth and also novice writers make local revisions, but skilled writers attend to both local and global process. Skilled writers, they look at the whole text and the whole story itself and based on that they do the writing, whereas uh, no, novice writers actually process text by paragraph by paragraph. Also, skilled writers have th uh, these structures, uh, this revision process all in their mind before writing and so they develop this writing process um, in, in a more efficient manner. Now, visual special aspects of the text, speech is fleeting and invariable while writing is, uh, is lasting and visible. Now, writers have different relationship with text as does the speech with a narrative. Text produced so far provides auxiliary memory during writing and revision process. Basically, written language is relatively permanent and laid out in a two dimensional space. What this means is that the writer has a different relationship with the text than a speaker has with the narratives. Now, when we give a speech, we may forget whether we have already made a particular point or we may uh, inevitably skip over information we were meant to tell. But when we write, we do not have this kind of a uh, memory limitations because what we are writing is in front of us. So, since we can always revive what we have written, the text produced so far serves as a sort of an auxiliary memory and that is what we are talking about. So, text forms a auxiliary memory. Furthermore, we usually know about where in the text uh, to search for certain pieces of information. Now, to some extent, we rely on a memory of the sequences of ideas in the text to find the information, but we rely on spatial memory as well. We often know about where on a page to find a particular kind of information in a text we are looking for. Special information is important for uh, revising uh, text uh, writers and more efficient in detecting errors on page boundaries which are visible in text presentation mode uh, that when the boundaries are not visible. Now, skilled writers rely on visual special informations for uh, their texting, organizing text into paragraphs, finding information in text produced so far and detecting errors in revision and that is what skilled writers actually do to writing a uh, text or to writing written text. So, uh, that uh, brings us to an end on this section, on this lecture. Now, I will quickly review what we did in this lecture. We looked at what is dyslexia and how does dyslexia point us into uh, the errors in reading. We looked at certain uh, models of reading. So, uh, we looked at how dyslexia can be uh, a uh, model system to un tell you what kind of problems happen in reading. We looked at precursors to reading, those factors which help us in reading, for example, phonological awareness, alphabetic principles and so on and so forth. We looked at uh, uh, the uh, how do we screen for dyslexia and what are the various brain systems related to dyslexia. We looked at what are the cognitive systems which help us in uh, writing uh, the three uh, systems of, uh, uh, of uh, understanding the symbol, combining letters and <coughs> composing text and also looked at how external area plays its role into writing. We looked at how learning to spell has its role to play in writing and we looked at how development trajectory of writing progresses. We looked at how text is composed and we looked at a detailed Hayes model and how, what are the visual uh, special aspects of any text. Now, when we meet next, we will look at uh, another interesting phenomena uh, in, in uh, uh, the psychology of language which is called bilingualism which is basically 
two how uh, somebody has two languages or somebody uses two languages what are the principles what are the nature what are the factors all those things we will do when we meet next and uh, discuss bilingualism which is another interesting aspects of psychology of language but till we do that it is goodbye from here thank you. Mm -hmm.